Good morning. Happy Sabbath once again. There was a little girl who, she lived kind of in town, but her mother had grown up on a farm. And so in the summertime, her mom would take her out there and let her stay for a few weeks on end with her grandmother and kind of experience farm life. And it was a typical farm back in the day, you know, had a uh, hundred some acres and uh, grandma would get up early and she'd make a big breakfast for her grandfather and some of the uncles that still lived at home and the men would go out there and work on the farm. Ladies would take care of some of the chores. And one of the things that this little girl always remembered and appreciated <clears throat> was that her grandmother uh, let her use this very nice special little whisk that she had. It was, you know, kind of a typical looking whisk, but it had a ceramic handle with little hand painted blue flowers on it. And, Years went by and, and uh, old grandmother passed away and as they were cleaning out the family farm, she saw that old whisk and she kept it as a family heirloom. It had a lot of special memories to her. And as time went on, she had a daughter of her own. She would use that whisk and get it out just for that special occasion to make breakfast every now and again for the family. One time they had a fire at the house and I just came up in the middle of the night. The house began to be engulfed in flames, and she and her husband, they got out, and they got the kids out, and they got the dog out, and they're sitting out there, and the flame, the house is just going up in flames. It's a total loss, and the fire department's pulling up, and then just out of nowhere, the woman bolts back into the house, and she remembered the special heirloom. She came back out, and you know, the, it just gets out just in time as timbers are falling, and the fireman, the fire chief, asked her, says, Lady, are you crazy? You could have been killed. And she said, I know, but it was well worth the whisk. <laughs> Has nothing to do with the sermon. By the way. <laughs> we have a hymn in our hymn book. It's hymn number 122. Hymn number 122, Great is the Lord. And it starts, you probably pretty familiar with it is great is the Lord and greatly to be praised you know, it's one we do fairly often and the final verse it begins with these words it says worship the Lord present yourself to him presenting yourself to someone is not a term that we use very often when I, I think of someone being presented you know, uh, I think of, uh, you know, some big sort of a, a gala event, right? Where, you know, you're invited, like a coronation of a king or whatever, and you've got a, the, some fancy thing, and you've got to wear your, your best tuxedo, and some guy in a tuxedo is there. And when you get there, you hand him the invitation, and he says, I now present Mr. and Mrs. Jones of the Jones Literacy Foundation, or whatever you are, you know, presenting someone. I don't go to too many of those kinds of uh, parties. <laughs> uh, the kind of places I go to, uh, it's more like, uh, you know, hey, kick off shoes, come on in, <laughs> sort of a thing. But it got me to thinking about being presented, being presented. When we think about presenting ourselves, what does that mean? And do we ever think about how we present ourselves to the Lord? How we present ourselves to God? And that's what I'd like to talk about. How to present yourself to the Lord. How to present yourself to the Lord. We're going to look at three aspects of presenting yourself to the Lord. The physical aspect, the emotional aspect, and the spiritual aspect of presenting ourselves to the Lord. I'd like to begin today with the physical aspect. What does it really mean to present yourself? We read a story about someone who was faced with this situation, something maybe they had not been familiar with, but were thrust into, and that's in the story of Daniel. So let's turn to Daniel chapter 1. Let's think about what's going on here with Daniel and his situation. Daniel 1, and we'll just start in verse 1, just get a little bit of the background here. Daniel 1 and verse 1. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. 
and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. So here basically what we see is Judah and Jerusalem this, and the surrounding area there is, is falling to the Babylonian Empire. Verse 3 says, And then the king instructed Espenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them, so that at the end of the time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, to them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name of Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. We're probably pretty familiar with this story. A lot of very prominent stories that come out of uh, the book of Daniel. Uh, I, I think of Veggie Tales and uh, the bunny, right? The bunny, the bunny. I love the bunny. You know, about, about the bowing down before this statue, right? Of course, Daniel and the lion's den. There's a lot of prophetic uh, imagery here as well. The statue with the head of gold and, and so forth. So we think about Daniel. It's good to understand the context. Where was that? He was basically kidnapped, he would say, from his homeland. And he was taken away and forced to serve before the king. He had no parents. He had no family. He was basically a ward of the state. A, a modern day interpretation of this is if you think about something like you've probably seen like the James Bond or the Jason Bourne movies, right? Where somebody really doesn't have a family and they're kind of taken into the system and becomes part of a military special ops force or CIA or something like that. And that becomes their family and they're trained and they're conditioned to do a specific job, right? To be, you know, in those cases, usually be some super spy or something like that. It's not just a job that you would throw anybody off of the street into, right? It takes a special sort of a person to do this job. I think it's important. We should keep that in mind as we go forward. Verse 8 <clears throat> says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs, and the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel says, I don't really want to take part of all this indoctrination training with this food, all the party life. You know, he'll, he'll do what he's supposed to do, but he doesn't want to get into the debauchery that goes on with being you know, in the king's presence. And the eunuch says, well, hey, that's great for you, but you know what? <laughs> if I'm in charge of you and you come into the court looking all shabby and terrible and, and sick and pale and the gills and all that stuff, he says, it's going to be my head on a platter. <laughs> and so he says, uh, I, I don't know if I'm too wild about this idea. But Daniel knew he had to stay spiritually faithful. And he knew that getting drawn into the food and drink in the king's court could take him away from where he needed to be and into this relationship with God. And that's very important, and we're going to talk about that a little later on, but let's just continue the story for right now. <clears throat> Verse 11 says, So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief, chief of the eunuchs had said over Daniel, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you, and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies, as you see fit. So deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. So Daniel said, you know, I understand. You don't want to lose your head. Let's just give it a ten-day test run. And at the end of the ten days, verse 15, at the end of the ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Daniel's physical appearance mattered to the king of Babylon. Now, he wasn't before him all the time, of course. But when he was in the king's presence, it was something that was being observed. It was something that he was being judged on. And I think a question worth asking for us is, does the king of kings 
and Lord of Lords deserve any less respect than what the King of Babylon did? I think the answer to that is rather obvious. I know that God sees us, you know, no matter where we are, where we go, we can't hide from him. But when we come before him, particularly at Sabbath services, is there something to be said about how we appear, how we look before him on this holy time? Should we put more or less thought into how we come to services than maybe what we do if we go to you know, work or do some shopping or something like that? There's a difference in what you'd wear to church versus a doctor's appointment versus doing yard work. Uh, I, most of you guys uh, know I'm, I'm kind of a gearhead. I'm you know, working on cars or whatever, things like that. And when I go out and do that, I usually wear rubber gloves, like the kind that you see that, uh, that doctors use, you know, those blue latex gloves, because it really helps keep the grease and oil and all the chemicals off your hands. If I walked into church wearing those, I'd look pretty weird, wouldn't I? <laughs> wouldn't it really be the appropriate thing to wear to church? It'd be out of place. So I think we recognize that you dress differently for different occasions. Likewise, we should treat how we arrive and when we arrive to services accordingly. Someone says we're having a cookout at four o'clock or we're having a cookout this afternoon, swing by any time after four, and you get there at 4.30 or 6.15 or whatever, it doesn't really matter because it's a drop-in. But if you have a doctor's appointment at 8.15, you're gonna be at that doctor's appointment at 8.15, aren't you? You're probably gonna be there a little bit earlier so you can get checked in, do your paperwork, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The same should be true for Sabbath services. We should strive, and I understand there's challenges, things come up, but we should do what we can to be there on time and be ready so that we can start services when services begin, 10.30, 2.30, whatever the appointed time is. You know, and another thing in considering, in Daniel's story here, is worth considering, is that not just anyone could go before the king at any time. You had to be called before the king. If you read other stories, uh, Esther, right? She was queen of Persia, but she couldn't even go and see her own husband unless he made an appointment or if he granted clemency, basically, and held out the golden scepter when you tried to approach the throne. If, if you didn't, it was off with your head. In other words, you had to be part of a pretty special group in order to go before the king. The king, as we read about here, he picked only the best of the best. He wanted the finest looking people to be in front of him. He didn't want to see ugly or shabbily dressed people come before him. And he is the king. He could do that. He could pick and choose. Now, we can't do anything about, you know, our, our physical looks. I'm not talking about that. But the things that we can do things about, how we dress, how we present ourselves, arriving in a time and manner. We need to understand and respect God and respect the Sabbath day in that regards. God actually gives some instructions about coming before him to ancient Israel, just before they were ready to receive the covenant there on Mount Sinai. Turn back to Exodus 19. Exodus 19, we'll start in verse 1. Exodus 19, verse 1, it says, In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, for they had departed from Rephidim and come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God and the Lord, excuse me, went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. We actually read through a little bit of this last week when we were talking about the place of safety in a, in a different context, talking specifically about that phraseology of using eagles' wings. 
Verse 5, he says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, so he's making an offering to them, say, I offer this covenant, this agreement to you. It says, If you will do this, then you will be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to Israel. He's offering to enter into this covenant with them. He's inviting them to come into his presence, right? This is the moment that the old covenant is ready to be instituted. Verse 10, Moses he goes and relays the, the, the information. Verse 10, then the Lord says to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. And let them be ready for the third day, for on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. They had just escaped Egypt, right? They had been running around out in the desert. They probably weren't real clean and presentable. He says, take time, wash your clothes, go get prepared, be ready to come before me. Well, God has a certain expectation there. He wants us to do, to look, to be our best. Take a shower, comb your hair, brush your teeth, you know. Wear clothing that's appropriate for the Sabbath. And overall, I think we do a good job of this as a congregation. But you know, I think it's something worth considering, worth thinking about. Why is it that we do it? <laughs> we don't just do it to look good for one another, or show off a new suit <laughs> or, or whatnot. We do it because we are coming before God's presence. And there's something to be said for our physical appearance each Sabbath. I'd like to move on to the emotional aspect of presenting your, ourselves to God. And then you might think, okay, well, how do I emotionally present myself to God? Seems like a kind of a, a weird phrase. And I think maybe to answer that, we'll start by looking at what we don't do what being emotionally present is not. Said another way, what it means to be emotionally distant or absent from God, which can lead eventually to emotional infidelity. Uh, emotional infidelity, that's when basically you, you seek emotional fulfillment, and this is often used like in couples that are having issues, emotional fulfillment through someone outside your spouse. You know, you're closer to someone, maybe a friend at work, than your own spouse. And I'm not talking about every now and again, you know, as a wife, you say to, you know, one of your girlfriends, man, I talked to my husband, but he just doesn't get it. <laughs> or, or guys every now and again getting together with a group and you go camping, you know, for a weekend and just to be with the guys. I'm not saying we can't do those sorts of things, right? I'm not talking about that. But if chronically we are being closer emotionally <laughs> to someone other than our spouse, then we're not being emotionally faithful to them. Translate this into our relationship with God. Translate this into our relationship with God and specifically what you're willing to present to Him. Not just physical appearance, not just talking about that. Not just on the Sabbath day, but anytime. How emotionally available are you to God? Are there things that bother you? Are there things that give you great joy? that you'll talk to the next door neighbor about, or a friend at church, but you don't bother to spend time in prayer talking to God? Are we emotionally available? Do we share that, what we feel? Do we have an emotional connection to God? It's not talking about a spiritual connection. We'll get to that in a little bit, but an emotional connection. I'm gonna take a look at somebody who appears to have had a, I guess you would say, rough patch when it comes to their emotional connection with God. They were a faithful servant. They were a powerful servant. But they got to a point in time where maybe they weren't quite as connected to God as what they could have been. Let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Is that 2 Kings? Let's get back here. 1 Kings 19. First Kings 19, we'll start in verse 1. 
It says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servants there. This was after the big showdown on Mount Carmel, right, with the 400 prophets of Baal, and, and uh, God showed who he was and consumed the sacrifice, and the 400 prophets were killed. That's in the previous chapter. Elijah was clearly doing God's work. He was being a faithful servant. The spiritual connection was strong, but as we're going to see, emotionally speaking, maybe he wasn't quite as connected as, as what he could have been. I'm not here to try to judge uh, Elijah, but as we see here, I think you will see he was feeling fairly distant. Verse 4, he says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Yeah, I'm not trying to judge Elijah, but it's been my experience. If anybody gets to the point where they say, just kill me now, <laughs> they're probably not very emotionally connected with the person that they're speaking with, right? And that's where Elijah's at. Verse 5 says, Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. Even though Elijah was maybe a, a bit frustrated and distant from God, uh, God in his loving tenderness and mercy knew that Elijah maybe was a bit hangry, right? <laughs> that is, hangry, hungry, and, and angry. You've seen the Snickers commercials, right, with Betty White and all that. It was a few years ago at the Super Bowl. Um, he was a, a, you know, he was worn out, and, and he was grumpy in that sense. And God recognized that, so he provides him some food there. Verse 8, so he rose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. It's a miracle in itself, right? 40 days and nights on this meal. Verse 9, there he went to a cave. He spent the night in that place, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah had a little bit of time to maybe clear his thoughts, clear his head a little bit. God says, Elijah, what are you doing? <laughs> Where's your head at? What do you think? We've probably all had friends who knew us quite well. And maybe we were acting a little off kilter. Maybe we were a little emotionally distanced. And I said, Dan, what's going on? That's what God is doing with Elijah right here. He said, what are you doing here? Verse 10 says, So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets in the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Boo-hoo, woe is me. <laughs> you know, Elijah's feeling uh, 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 pretty low at this point in time. I did all this stuff uh, for you. Look, nothing happens, and now I'm ready to die. Uh, you don't even care about me or anything I'm doing. You know, he's just not really emotionally connected to God in a, in a positive way here. Verse 11. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountain and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. That's a strong wind. <laughs> It's breaking a mountain up and rocks. Uh, that, that's pretty fierce. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. All these big, magnificent, powerful things. Maybe sometimes the things that we expect to see, you know, when it comes to a, a, a sign or a miracle or a relationship with God. And he says, that's not it. And after the fire was a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face, his mantle, and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave, and suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Again, God asked him a question. He says, What are you doing? God was not finished 
using Elijah. In fact, Elijah was going to go and anoint two kings and his uh, successor, Elisha. He was doing the work of God. He was being spiritually faithful. But you know, at this moment in time, he wasn't feeling very close to God. He was distant. He thought God didn't care about him. Of course, that wasn't true. It wasn't true at all, but that's how he felt. And he felt that way because, I think we could say safely, he had become a little emotionally distant. He wasn't connected to God on that emotional level. He had maybe lost a little bit of that personal connection. He was obeying the letter of the law, doing the things that he should, but somehow he felt disconnected. If we feel alone, if we feel abandoned, abandoned excuse me, by God, even though maybe we're faithfully coming every week, we're tithing, we're you know keeping God's food laws, maybe, like Elijah, we've been a little emotionally unfaithful to God. Maybe we haven't been as available to God our Father as what we are our friends. We complain and moan about our problems to others. We share joy. But we've neglected, perhaps, to take time to talk to God about it. Sure, we go to Him with our request. We're all pretty good at that. But have we bothered to share how we feel? Have we bothered to share how we feel? Are we a friend of God as Abraham was? Do we have that sort of connection? Or is he just a ethereal sort of a presence, something that we respect but don't necessarily understand or think of as a loving father and a being? Let's consider James chapter 4 here for a moment, James 4. James 4, and we're going to start in verse 4. James 4 and verse 4 says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? jealously. Now this scripture isn't telling us that we can't have friends in the world or we can't have physical humans as friends. But it points out that if we have a closer connection perhaps with them than what we do with God, uh, we have a problem. We have a problem. We're setting ourselves up for some challenges. Now we can be emotionally unfaithful to God if we go through a challenge and maybe we pray and say, well, I put it in God's hands and we spend 20 seconds doing that. And then we spend 20 minutes telling our friend, you know, how we feel about it and how terrible it is. And I understand we need human connection. We need to talk and share with one another. I'm not saying that you can't do those things, but are we sharing with others on that emotional level and holding back from God? That's what we have to be careful of. It's okay to share feelings with our friends, but do we neglect sharing how we feel with God? And I know we can't hide how we feel, but do we ever take time to express that in prayer or meditation? Verse 8 here, still in James chapter 4. He says, Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Now here he's specifically talking about humbling ourselves and repenting, and certainly we should do that when we need to repent. But what it points at is getting close, mourning. And when we mourn, we should take time and mourn with God. I'm not talking about having a, a gripe fest and complain but it's okay to share your feelings. I have people ask me sometimes, is it okay to be angry even with God? The answer is yes. Now, just like it is with a human being, I wouldn't stay that way. But you know, if you sit there and say, oh, everything's fine, God's will be done, and inside it's burning you up, how could he do this to me? 
we're being emotionally unfaithful. If we don't share that in our prayer, if we don't share that in meditation, we need to have that closeness. It might be something very good, in fact, that happens. Maybe it's not anger. Maybe, you know, you got a, a nice raise at work, and so you go around and, and you take the family out to dinner and maybe you tell some friends things are going well for you, but do you take time to celebrate with the Lord? Share with them how happy you are, how much He's blessed you. Do you let Him be a part of your life that way? When it comes to presenting ourselves to God, make sure it's not just something we do physically once a week. Make sure we take time in our prayer life every day to share with Him how we feel, what we think, what we're going through. Give thanks. Share the joy. Share the love. Share the appreciation for the sense of peace perhaps He's given you through a different trial. Present yourself available to the Lord so that you can have a deep emotional connection with Him as well. This brings us to the spiritual aspect of being presenting ourselves to the Lord. This goes beyond just that emotional connection to something a little bit deeper. I turn to Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8. Jose Joel Amos. Amos chapter 8, verse 5. It's breaking into the context here. It says, When will the new moon be passed that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may trade wheat? Here we see people who are clearly not emotionally very connected with God. They're not very focused on the Sabbath day or the holy days. They were anxious for the Sabbath to be over so they could get about their business that they wanted to do. It's probably safe to say they didn't get a lot out of the sermon that day. <laughs> they were otherwise preoccupied. Verse, uh, continuing on, he says, uh, making the ephah small and the shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit. Well, worse than being disconnected in an emotional sort of a way, they were actually not paying attention because they had evil on their mind. They were trying to figure out, you know, how to cheat people there in the, in the marketplace by uh, falsifying the weights and the units of measure and things like that. Now, we might not do anything, you know, quite so intentionally evil, but have we ever been guilty of watching the clock on a Saturday night <laughs> so that we can see, okay, now I can turn on, you know, the TV to watch the movie or the game or whatever, you know? Of course, we, you know, respect the Sabbath, the sunset, the sunset, but do we just become clock watchers at one point? Uh, unlike being, you know, just emotionally unavailable to God, instead of sharing things that we feel with Him, now we're starting to drag things into services, perhaps, that don't belong there. Things that we're worried about, the work situation, a school situation, what we're going to do after the Sabbath. If they take our focus off of worshiping God on the Sabbath day, now we've gone from an emotional unavailability, not presenting ourselves to God emotionally, to spiritually not presenting ourselves, not really being there to worship Him, as we're supposed to, on the Sabbath day. Another way that we can be present physically, but absent spiritually, is that if Perhaps by focusing on one aspect of presenting ourselves to God, we miss maybe the main point, which is the spiritual connection. We overdo it, and, and we overcorrect by putting too much emphasis on, say, the physical aspect. Let's turn to 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3. First Peter three, keeping in mind that what we really need to be doing is being spiritually present before God. First Peter three, verse three it says, "Do not let your dormant be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel." 
Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. This section of scripture is talking uh, specifically, to, specifically to wives, uh, their appearance and how they uh, uh, behave as wives, how they present themselves to their husbands. But it raises an important issue here. It says, don't put so much emphasis on your physical ex you know, appearance that you miss out on what your real purpose is. The same can be applied for us in coming to church. Yeah, we should try to look our best. We should try to look nice. <laughs> but if we're getting dressed up for one another, then we're missing the point, aren't we? And now we have taken one thing and we've gone a little too far with it. Yes, we should, you know, look our best. But deep down inside, what we need to be is someone who desires to be at Sabbath services. Someone who wants to be there so that they can be edified, spiritually speaking. So they can get the most out of the message and the fellowship that day. Turn to Isaiah 58, if you would. Isaiah 58. Starting in verse 1, it says, Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people the transgressions and the house of Jacob their sin. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask me of the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have you afflicted our souls and you have taken no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and you exploit all your laborers. God's talking out that people said that they wanted to honor him. <laughs> they said they wanted to glorify him. They said they wanted to know the ordinances, but there was a disconnection, spiritually speaking. You know, he's talking about a fast they're doing, and, and they're doing it so that they can get what they want. They can get God's attention. They're missing out, though, on what actually needed to be done. Verse 4, it says, Indeed, you fast for strife and debate, and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. No, they were just trying to get attention. They were not spiritually present. They were just taking a physical thing and trying to make that be their presence. And there was more to it than that. Verse 5. Is it a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? <laughs> no, they looked like they were suffering and miserable. Now, Jesus over in Matthew 6 talks about those who you know, would disfigure themselves, say, oh, it's so terrible, I'm fasting, it's so rough on me. You know, and they did this as a physical presentation, but they missed the spiritual connection. They actually were very far from God. Now what this points to, all of these things point to, is a problem that has plagued humanity. It has plagued God's people since the beginning. It was a problem for the children of Israel. It was a problem there in Peter's time. It's a problem with the church today. Sometimes we present ourselves before God, physically, with all the right words and all the right actions, but our hearts aren't there. I don't just mean hearts as an emotional sort of a thing. I mean on that deepest of levels, spiritually connected. It's sad to say, but in the church over the year, there have always been seat warmers. People who were there just to be there. They thought that this is where I need to go, so I get the email that comes out that says this is where the place of safety is going to be. Or this is how I'm going to save myself. Or X or Y or Z. That's always existed. People who went through the motions, just showing up every week, you know, but weren't really there. I mean, many of us have been around for a long time, part of an organization that had well over 100,000 people. And there's just a handful today that still keep the commands of God. You know, and it can be disheartening. And the sad reality is that it has happened, even within the body of Christ. And I don't say this to try to beat down on anybody, but it's something that we need to be aware of. We need to understand it's more than just showing up. 
It's being here with all of yourself, having that emotional connection, being here for the right spiritual reasons, that I'm here to learn, I'm here to be edified, I'm here to know more about my God and understand His plan and serve Him in whatever way He sees fit. If we aren't here, if we aren't present in that way, the end result is that we become something God really can't work with, that He really can't do a lot with. Let's go back to where we started in Daniel 1. Daniel 1. Daniel 1, we read over this, but I want to read this scripture one more time and think about what Nebuchadnezzar's design was for his plan. Daniel 1 verse 5 says, The king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them. He was investing in them. He was taking time so that at the end of that time, they might serve before the king. Nebuchadnezzar was building an empire. It was a human empire. It would not last. It had other issues, but he was building something. He brought these people before him. He wanted to take a look at them, put an eyeball on them and say, is this somebody that I can work with? Is this somebody that can serve in my administration? He wanted to see what they were made of. Could they handle different situations? Could they be in front of a head of state, as it were? God does the same with us. He's building something through Jesus Christ. Although unlike the king of Babylon, this is something that's going to last. I think sometimes we might have a tendency forget to forget that we are part of a very special group. A very special group. And we are privileged to be called to be here. Let's begin to conclude today in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. We'll start in verse 13. Matthew 16 and verse 13 says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So he said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, some Jer others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said, okay. He said, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter, who was always shy, and didn't want to be the first one to speak. <laughs> Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ the Son of the living God. The disciples had gotten to the point. You know, uh, up until this time through Jesus' ministry, you know, they could just be following Jesus Christ as a wise teacher, as a good rabbi. But the time had come that Jesus Christ had to know, can I count on you guys? <laughs> Are you going to be my disciples, these twelve that I need to serve me. Verse 17. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. This rock he's referring to as himself, Jesus Christ, is that rock that the church is built on. But he says, I'm building something here. I'm building something, not just gathering together a few guys to launch a revolt against Rome. <laughs> he said, I'm building something, his church, something that will last forever. I'm like Nebuchadnezzar's empire. The word church here is ecclesia, and it means a called out assembly, a called out assembly. Each week when we come to services, you know, we aren't just people that are getting together for an informal little, ga little gathering, a cookout on Sunday afternoon or something like that. But we're coming before God 
on holy time for specific ordained events. Sabbath services. This is a commanded assembly. Christ is only working with a small group at this time. You know, just as Nebuchadnezzar only worked with a small group. Yes, all of mankind will have an opportunity to be a part of family of God eventually. But right now, here in this room today, is a select group of people that God is working with. He says, I want you because I'm trying to build something. And he calls us on the Sabbath day, this holy convocation, because he has something special he's doing. And he wants to know if he can count on us to do it. Every Sabbath day, and on all the appointed feast days during the years, we present ourselves to God in a physical way. When we do so, we should remember we're not just going before anyone or to some sort of a casual occasion, not just a social gathering. We're there to worship God. We're there to honor the King. And at all times, not just the Sabbath day, we need to present ourselves to God as being emotionally available, sharing with Him what it is we feel, what it is we're enduring, not showing one thing on the outside or just saying in our prayers, I'm so happy and <laughs> grateful and whatnot, when maybe we don't feel that way at the moment. We need to be honest with God and share those things, respectful, but honest. Make ourselves available to Him so that He can be available to us. And spiritually, we have to ask ourselves, why am I here? Right? We've all heard that many times. Why am I actually here? Am I connected to God via His Holy Spirit on a spiritual level? Or am I just putting in an appearance? Am I just here for the donuts? You know, Why is it that I'm here? Because if we're not here for the right reason, it makes it very difficult for Him to work with us. And make no mistake, He is working with us. He is working with us. He's doing something special through his ecclesia, through his called out ones. He's making a church, a bride, a family, something that will exist through eternity in the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm.